Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I will try to do my best uh, to relaunch your metabolism after hopefully a good lunch. And um, maybe just a few words of introduction. So I'm with the European Space Agency and I'm responsible at the European Space Agency um, for the Earth observation satellites and operations, for everything relating to the satellites in operations, to the ground segments, the data management aspects. And I'm also coordinating for the European Space Agency a topic that I see as a framing topic for a lot of the things that you're discussing here, a framing um, theme that is emerging under the label digital twins. And I will try to explain a little bit how from the challenges of Earth observation data management um, we have reached the um, ability of what we call predictive, to do what we call predictive Earth observation um, with the help of uh, so-called digital twins. Uh, but before I do this, I want to take you on a little voyage into um, the history and um, the, uh, the very source of uh, the data that most of you are dealing with. So I will talk a little bit about the infrastructure um, that we are operating and uh, we'll just paint a little bit the, the picture from 15 years ago towards what we are seeing today. So I'm taking a little bit the look from the European perspective and uh, from a European Space Agency perspective. The big programs that we are operating, of course, are the Earth Explorer program and the Copernicus uh, program. And um, this uh, has completely changed our approach to how we handle data, how we deal with the communities and how the infrastructures and uh, how we involve industry, industrial infrastructures in, um, in the task that we have uh, in front of us. Earth Observation is by far the largest um, directorate of uh, the European Space Agency. We have an annual budget of about 1.7 billion. And this is a very important um, point in time for us because in November this year we will have a, a ministerial conference in which the 22 member states will decide on the contribution uh, to ESA for the next three years, the funding for ESA for the next three years. And of course, it's the applications uh, that are driving the attractivity and the need for the Earth observation uh, topics that we are putting in front of uh, the ministers to um, to uh, sign up on, on the budgets that we will um, need in order to do all the things that we want to do. Um, the look 15 years ago, um, from our perspective, we had a few big individual satellites for a few types of measurements uh, and for very specific communities, uh, typically scientific uh, communities, very much focused, very much grown in a, in a specific uh, um, um, discipline. And um, to give examples, big uh, satellites with multiple instruments, ERS, uh, Envisat in particular, uh, representing an era where uh, we were trying to optimally serve these specific communities and scientific domains. Um, the real origin and one of the earliest fleets of Earth-observing satellites were, of course, dedicated to meteorology and um, are today operated also by our colleagues at um, UMITSAT in, in, uh, in Germany. Now the picture has completely changed. As I mentioned, uh, we have a, a large fleet of uh, Copernicus Sentinels, uh, seven big satellites. We have a fleet of Earth Explorer satellites, another six satellites. Uh, we have scout missions, we have uh, FISATs, we have of course, still a meteor satellite fleet that has uh, expanded. Uh, and we have uh, a lot of new space players in Europe, which uh, um, are especially important to us because one of the key tasks that we have been fulfilling over the decades is to integrate commercial data, in particular very high resolution data that is not generated by Copernicus and the Earth Explorers into the services and applications um, that, um, that um, now shape the overall domain of Earth observation uh, services and applications. Services, science, technology, commercial applications, indicating that the user community has uh, dramatically diversified, and uh, there's no such thing as a specific user community anymore, even 
the typology efforts that we have done over the last uh, decade always uh, were quickly becoming obsolete because uh, we realized that uh, users that uh, were completely out of the, the scope um, up to that point immediately took a, an important role in this uh, ecosystem. From a European perspective, of course, the national missions and, as mentioned, the commercial missions are part of, of that infrastructure and that ecosystem. And we should say, and um, I say that with a little bit of pride, that we in Europe really have one of the biggest and uh, most sophisticated infrastructures um, of, uh, for Earth observation in the world. So we have grown from... Uh, of, uh, careful steps in the Earth observation um, domain uh, 15, 20 years ago towards a very operational and a very broad application and service-oriented um, ecosystem of infrastructure, but most important uh, also of the ground systems um, and uh, the data management aspects that, um, that are so important here for, for our discussions. So again, 15 years ago, small data in the sense that um, some of the satellites were generating perhaps one petabyte over 10 years. Even if you, if you were processing these data sets to different levels, few, user few users in these communities, maybe hundreds, hundreds of users, thousands of users, specialist users, um, no fusion with the data industry. Um, we had a ESA, a, a, a proprietary ESA asset infrastructure in place that was fixed in order to support these missions. All of this has changed. Now we have a very complex data management system that is entirely industrialized. So the interaction and the partnership with uh, European industry in order to, um, to be able to acquire, to process, to archive, and to transform data into um, services and applications is one of the key features that has emerged over the last 10 to 15 years. The user communities have dramatically increased. We are now talking about hundreds of thousands of users, uh, even millions of users. In the spirit of this conference, I think the key message, of course, is that ESA data and uh, Copernicus data is free and open data, so fully fulfilling the spirit of what you're discussing here. And, um, everything that we are trying to do and to develop in order to increase the uptake of this data follows these uh, principles uh, very much. Specialist and non-specialist users have uh, merged. Uh, of course, um, one of the key challenges and probably the key term of reference for my own work is the ability to um, activate user communities that are even not yet aware that Earth observation data is relevant for them, is usable in the commercial, in the service, in the institutional domain, uh, but also, of course, in the scientific domain. Infrastructure and software, uh, we have uh, largely taken as a service uh, function in all the, in, 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 in this um, uh, big system that we, are, that, uh, that we have been building up. And again, we are integrating national and commercial data. From our perspective, one of the key challenges that is still remaining and is still part of the portfolio that we are looking at is the transformation and the valorization of the data with European assets and rules into reliable and relevant information so that we can truly cover the full value chain that this huge investment um, that the, the space Earth observation infrastructure constitutes can also be valorized um, at, the, at the full length of that, um, of, of, of that chain. Um, just a picture to give you a bit of a sense when I talk about data volumes, um, what I actually mean. Our data dissemination systems, um, meaning the first line of data dissemination because with uh, free and open data there is no limit to the layers of data dissemination that can actually be operating and that we are actually very much welcoming. But the one that we are controlling directly is disseminating uh, so much data each day that if you would put it on a high density disk would actually reach the size of the Eiffel Tower. So that's the data volume that goes from our ESA data hubs directly to the users. 
It's a figure that we are very proud of because in particular this is uh, Copernicus data. And Copernicus in its beginning was conceived as a system that would only serve six specific Copernicus services of the European Union or entrusted entities. And we have now grown a community around these data access uh, systems that is uh, uh, getting close to one million registered users. Just to remind everyone what the key data challenges in Earth, Earth observation were over the last um, 10 years. It was the, the big three Vs. Uh, there's also two other ones, or so two additional ones. So volume, velocity, so the, the availability, the quick availability of data uh, where it's needed, the variety of the data that we are seeing. One of the big revelations of the last few years was the fact that the, we are realizing that our scientific missions um, are actually becoming a very valuable operational contribution to the more operational and service-oriented Copernicus system. So the boundary between purely scientific missions and operational slash service-oriented missions is being blurred. And uh, we see that the potential to generate programmatic lines for operational missions out of a R&D focused scientific program is, uh, is very much a reality these days. And um, just to give you a, a reverse example, which is showing the transparency of that categorization that was still valid a few years ago, the largest number of scientific publications in Earth observation on space-based Earth observation is actually done today with a specific set of Copernicus Sentinels. Good, then we have the, the veracity of the data, something that uh, is taking a, a very key uh, a role these days in terms of the robustness, the credibility of, uh, of the products and services that are being generated. And then um, the, the question of value, scientific insights, uh, social benefits, commercial value. Um, we are constantly in this um, challenge in order to illustrate these benefits in particular to the politicians, but also to the people that are electing the politicians in order to mobilize the budgets in, 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 um, in order to address the, the big societal challenges that we're facing today. And um, I don't have to mention them to you. Just to give you a few pointers, a few entry points into the question of digital twins. So what we have seen here is a set of new elements of consideration that have sprung up from this data challenge that I've been outlining. We see new and more flexible data policies. Uh, free and open here is the top uh, topic in this uh, slide, and that's something that has been guiding and is still guiding and increasingly guiding our considerations in order to develop and to foster the ecosystem uh, together with our partners. Um, licensing was mentioned in many presentations earlier. Um, and also the concepts, the commercial concepts, how to, um, to develop attractive business models where um, things like us uh, anchor customerage and um, innovative um, uh, schemes are being, being used. We are seeing a stronger focus on the information per se than the data. That's, I think, a general trend that everybody is observing. And another element is, of course, the question of data integration. We, we have numerous new ways, in particular in the form of the application platforms, um, the uh, public media, the service, uh, industrial service products, and the operational public uh, services that are integrating uh, Earth observation data where you wouldn't have found uh, Earth observation uh, previously. Uh, so that's a, that's a very strong new, new, new component in, uh, uh, to be considered. Uh, cloud platform-based data access, something that is a central topic here at this, um, uh, this meeting as well. And the realization that across the missions, but also across the agency and across agency and the industrial domain, Earth observation data can be fused to a degree that it becomes completely irrelevant for the user where the actual data is coming from. 
if specific things are being considered, are being observed, and the openness of the process, the credibility of the process that happens to the data is one of the key aspects to make that data fusion as, as reliable and as optimal as possible. And uh, we, we are working very closely together with our par uh, partners uh, at NASA, with uh, European partners to make this data fusion a, a, strong, a strong new component in, 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 in this ecosystem. And then finally, what we are realizing is that we can learn from the lessons and from the potential that we have seen evolving in the domain of meteorology and climate research, where modeling and predictive scenarios of what will happen in the future if certain parameters are being changed, if observational data is constantly fed into this model, that this predictive potential of system can be expanded into other domains of Earth observation. And that's basically our fundamental uh, idea about digital twins of the future, to take this concept, the power of high-performance computing, of artificial intelligence, of generating scenarios that can serve as the basis for decision-making to the next level. And we are working hand-in-hand -hand here with the European Union. We have joined with our partners UMITSAT and ECMWF into a big program that we call, uh, that is called DESTINY, uh, a program that is funded by the European Union and in which these three entities, um, us together, um, uh, are uh, setting up digital twins in the first phase to particularly address questions of extreme events and of climate change adaptation. And the underlying idea, again, is what if we create a comprehensive digital replica of the Earth that stimulates and observes human-Earth interactions with high accuracy, uses the technologies that I've just mentioned, is continuously updated, so it's always fed with the, the most recent and relevant data sets, enables the simulation and prediction capabilities, and provides detailed views of the past because the past feeds into the current analysis and into the prediction and the future models and simulations that um, are key for, for realizing that ambition and that vision of uh, digital twins. Just a few comments on the infrastructure and on the, on the, the way that we structure the um, the functionality, so cloud infrastructures, of course, play an important role. All Copernicus data is available on the cloud. HPC infrastructures, what we are learning and what we are understanding, how to harness the power of high-performance computing centers for data processing, but most of all for the modeling aspects uh, of what we, what, we, what we are intending to do. The harmonization of data lakes, um, the harnessing the um, capacity and the capabilities of simulation and observation centers, and again, AI software science competence centers, and the networks in order to uh, be able to access uh, the results or disseminate the results as, as needed. So these are the typical architectural element, elements that we are putting together in order to make, um, to make uh, these uh, digital twins a reality. Simulation and monitoring, past, present, future. One of the key aspects of a digital twin is digital twins should be usable by people who are not used to deal with geospatial data, that are not used to deal with Earth observation data. So the aspect of visualizing and visualization of the potential of this data and handling of the data is one of the central um, requirements um, uh, for these systems. And um, we are seeing applications emerging now all over the place which um, facilitate a, a complete uh, rearranging of what I would call the scientific community behind these things. Destination Earth, uh, Digital Twin and Earth Principles. Um, again, these are a few architectural elements. Um, um, we are on a very tight uh, schedule for these activities and um, we want to go out with the system, go live with the system by the end of uh, next year. And uh, we are involving larger user communities and then larger and larger communities over the next uh, three years. Openness, again, one of the key principles. 
and um, collaboration, visibility aspect, interaction aspects, uh, very key. Um, just to illustrate that I'm not uh, uh, talking only about um, things that are emerging, some of the applications, some of the potential uh, scenarios that we can work with have already emerged in precursor activities to the digital twins that we have been feeding with the Earth observation data that we are generating. Um, just to go quickly through a few examples, so this is the case of Antarctic there, where you have a very complex system of uh, climate, ocean, ice sheet, water, and uh, a lot of uh, dynamic, uh, Antarctica is, is, a, is, a, is a very dynamic place in which you can test and challenge a modeling system to its extreme, and it's one of the key applications, of course, in the context of climate change. Again, a few schematic drawings here, how these elements are interacting. It goes from snow grain size to albedo. Uh, everything is fed into the system in order to generate these scenarios and to optimize the models and the scenarios that are coming out of these models. Uh, hydrology is another application domain that is um, taking center stage um, for obvious reasons these days. Uh, uh, in, in this case, uh, here we have looked at water management, uh, flood risk and landslide, uh, landslide risk associated with this topic. Um, forestry is another domain that we have systematically analyzed and where we have run demo activities uh, with, um, with uh, the help of, uh, of industry. Again, showing a little bit the various applications and outcomes that, uh, that can be generated. Food systems, food supply, very much on our minds uh, these days is another domain where this, where this approach seems to be highly promising and uh, has already generated very remarkable outcomes. The ocean system, another complex system um, that can be looked at and heat waves in the ocean system, something that I didn't know before, um, is, uh, is, of course, closely related and closely linked also with the models that have been developed in the, in the overall climate domain. Let me finish with uh, this example because from my personal experience and exposure to where digital twins are actually really entering our daily lives on a very tangible level, and where it's easy to illustrate the functionalities and the potential of digital twins, it's uh, the example of digital twin cities. Um, these digital twin cities are a bit special in the sense that they constitute the interface between what I would call engineering industry, sometimes call it product and production digital twins, and digital twins of natural systems. Uh, the slides, the previous slides were more focused on the natural systems, but interesting stuff and interesting applications happens, of course, at the interface. And in the end, the digital twins of the natural systems that I've been showing are very much dependent on the inputs and the data sets that will be provided uh, as a result of human activity and human interaction. Many of these digital twins are operational on a regional or local level. They are very diverse and typically the examples, the best examples that I've seen, they are very open. So the citizens that can profit from these digital twins uh, have very much access to the way that the scenarios on which they, as, as the, the affected people can decide on, um, are generated. Modeling, simulation AI are directly led, uh, led into a circular process for decision-making scenarios. And again, fully transparent integration of citizens in scenarios and decision cycles. So various cities in Europe are actually applying all the principles that I've tried to outline uh, theoretically here. Uh, more based on the engineering data than the natural system data, but Earth observation data is flowing increasingly into these, um, into these systems. Uh, heat data uh, is, a, is a big topic, for example, um, so that uh, people can actually make their own educated decision on how to, how to improve the local environment and the regional uh, environment they're living in. And that, I think, in a, on the small scale, very much exemplifies and illustrates the idea and the logic of digital twins as a tool for 
society, for individuals to make um, good decisions for the future um, of, um, of, of, of this planet. Um, just to conclude, this is my final slide, um, to illustrate a bit where the specific role of ESA lies in the context that I've been outlining here. So the free and openness of the data is at the core, and we are heavily defending that, uh, that, um, that uh, principle because we see the benefits and the potential of increasing and uh, reaching out into communities by the means of, of keeping that data policy as, as one of the leading principles. The other things, we are very much from an engineering and R&D perspective looking at novel acquisition, processing, archiving, analysis, integration approaches, application approaches. So that's another key element that's very much on our mind. And um, again, we are very much focusing on the data access options because if the user is not able to access the data in the most convenient way and most convenient typically in a platform way where it's not necessary actually to download the data. So in the sense that I hope the figures of data disseminated will actually go down at some point um, uh, is, uh, is, is, is clearly in the, in, the, in the cards here. And then uh, very high resolution data I've been mentioning. Um, this is something that uh, is, uh, is, is, a, is a global competition, I would say. It's a very commercial thing these days um, to uh, deal with very high resolution data and very high resolution data will be key for some of the most central applications and services to be grown out of the um, digital twin uh, context as well. And finally, ESA supports uh, measures to assure Earth observation data integrity the completeness of the data sets, uh, the timeliness of the data, the authenticity, and finally, and I think, again, very much in the spirit of this uh, meeting here, the openness of the data, um, which uh, I think uh, needs to stay at the center of everything that we are doing. With that, I close, and thank you very much.